can go ahead and take your seats. There will probably be bits and pieces of that today um, as we go through, but um, what I mentioned in my like, little blurb before coming to and start speaking, um, most of the time when we go into talks about Je being Jesus in the marketplace, what they actually mean is I'm going to try to tell you how to get words of knowledge for your barista and for your mailman and for the waiter or waitress. And that's not a bad thing. Um, but I honestly believe that where the body's at right now, specifically people who have the initiative to start businesses and actually try to think kingdom in the workplace, you don't need another class. And to be super honest, I'm sorry if the way I think about this offends you, praying for healing and prophesying is the easy part. That's the easy part. But actually living in such a way that releases the kingdom around you wherever you go, that's the part that takes digging and that's the part that takes work. That's the part, honestly, just based off of how Western culture is designed, that's the part that takes the most rewiring for us. Because the kingdom looks at your life holistically. It looks at the way you love your family. It looks at the way you treat the people who are serving you when you go out to dinner. It looks at the way you talk to your coworkers. It looks at the way you honor or don't honor your boss. It looks at all of that. Western culture says you just show up, you do the work, and you get the results, which is why, and I'll, again, I'll qualify this, which is why when we think evangelism, we think the spiritual laws, and we think, how do I just get you to pray the prayer and then move on? Because we're thinking about, you know, how do I pump them through the assembly line to get them to pray the prayer, I get a notch on my belt, and then we can move forward. And let me be clear, people do actually need to hear the gospel preached. That's I'm, What I'm not saying is that that's not what they need, or we need to forego that. What I am saying is if that's the only way you think about being Jesus in the marketplace, and the only way you think about bringing kingdom, your view is infinitely too small. Infinitely too small. Because here, and I'll get into this later in another portion, it's not just your gifts that bring people in your, into the kingdom of God, it's your fruit. Because it's very easy, again, to partner with the Holy Spirit in a moment, powers released, somebody gets healed, a prophetic word gets released over them, they encounter the love of Jesus. That part is simple, but you have to think about what are you actually inviting them into. We have a bunch of orphan sons and daughters in the kingdom right now because there were a bunch of people, and again, not knocking, this is just the state of where things are at right now. We had a whole move of evangelism that was just about, here's the track, pray the prayer, praise God, you're not going to hell, let's move on to the next one. And I praise God for those ministries because, again, the family has to grow somehow, but we have to, if we start thinking about kingdom, you're not all of a sudden just concerned with whether or not that person prayed the prayer, you're now concerned with their growth and actually their ability to move forward in the things of God. And again, that's bigger than just whether or not they prayed the prayer, whether or not they're going to heaven when they die. That's their whole life. A little bit about my journey with this um, and why I think about this the way I do and why I'm passionate about it. Um, I went to a Christian school, K through 12, and then I went to uh, William Jessup University, just up the road, uh, to get my degree in theology. But there was a brief period of uh, time, like two or three years, where I was going to uh, junior college, American River, and I was just getting general ed stuff done because I love William Jessup, but it's crazy expensive, and I don't need to be paying that for, for math classes. Um, right around the same time as I started doing that, healing and the prophetic started to emerge in my life. Simultaneously, somebody by the name of Todd White started getting really big. You guys know who I'm talking about when I say Todd White? Post videos online, still going hard after Jesus. He's a wild guy. Everywhere he goes, it's a word of knowledge. Somebody's getting healed. And that's amazing. What, that, what I perceived incorrectly, though, was that that is the only way to be Jesus in the marketplace, and that is the only thing. Like, evangelism only looks like that. So what that did for me, again, there's other stuff that goes into this as a firstborn, little bit of ungodly, like, over-responsibility that comes in. I'm walking in to American River College every day, 
And it goes beyond me just asking, Lord, who do you want to speak to? Who do you want to touch? And all of a sudden, now I'm having anxiety just about going there because I'm walking into the sea of people and I'm like, ah, everybody's my responsibility and I got to like all this stuff. So that's why I feel passionately about the kingdom of God and being Jesus in the marketplace has to be bigger than just that. Um, because I, I see what happened in my own heart in that season of my life and like just, again, it says you'll know a tree by its fruit. That way, of think, that way of thinking about kingdom, that way of thinking about evangelism, there was some good stuff that happened, but in me it bore the fruit of anxiety. So there has to be a bigger, more holistic, peaceful, Holy Spirit-filled way of looking at this whole thing. So what I'm going to present to you guys today, um, again, not a lot of technique, not necessarily a lot of here's how you do X, Y, and Z and get the results, because again, I think thinking that way is sort of part of the issue that we're here. Uh, that brought us here, but when you talk about thinking missionally, when you talk about thinking kingdom, you have to, like, the, the question gets begged, what mission is the Father actually on? Because again, we, we think mission and we instantly think, you know, I'm on a missions trip, playing with orphans somewhere, or I have to be, like, giving somebody a tract, I have to be, you know, giving them the spiritual laws. And again, that's all good. The mission that the Father's been on since Genesis is much bigger than that. So I'm going to be going through just like very fast, sort of a big overview of Scripture, but I want you to kind of like get the idea of what mission is the Father actually on. So you go to Genesis, right? Joe was talking about it. He creates humanity and he gives them dominion. So here's what we don't often realize about the creation stories that Eden was this specific plot of land where there was perfection, where there was the presence and peace of God. And then he then gives Adam and Eve the command, you know, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. What that means is that while there was peace in the presence of the Holy Spirit and the rule of God in that garden, which was Eden, that means that it was actually their job to grow and to expand, to actually expand the borders of Eden to the rest of creation. That means that the rest of creation didn't look like Eden at that time. It was Adam and Eve's job to extend that. Okay, enter the fall. That gets messed up. God comes to a guy named Abraham, gives him this promise. And what was key about that promise, and I think kind of skate over this most of the time, is that in that initial promise that he was giving to Abraham, he said, I'm going to bless you, and through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. All right, so there's a specific blessing that God gives to one person, one individual, one family group, and then that blessing is actually supposed to spread out from them. That's cool, Aaron. What sort of blessings did God give Abraham? It wasn't just spiritual. It wasn't just that they had a relationship with the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just that they had a relationship with Yahweh. But the blessings that God actually gave to Abraham extended beyond that. It was material, it was financial, it was familial, it was all of it. Another way to start thinking about this is if God actually showed up in your life and started living in your house with you, if Jesus was there, and yeah, he is, but you know, do this thought experiment with do you really think the only thing that would happen in your life is that you'd feel happier? He's so much bigger than that. Another picture of this is uh, when David was trying to get the Ark of the Covenant into the tabernacle, it makes a pit stop at somebody's house. And then the word says that that guy who was housing the tabernacle as it was making its journey, or housing the um, Ark of the Covenant as it was making its journey to the tabernacle, the word says that there was so there was abundant blessing on that guy's house. Fast forward even more. Israel as a whole, they now become a nation, and God gives them the same promise, the same idea that he gave to Abraham. I'm going to bless you, and through you guys, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. Fast forward to Jesus, fast forward to the bride. It's the same thing. I'm going to bless you. I have a relationship with you. Through you, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. So many different things running through my head right now. 
It's even in what Jesus told us to pray. You know the Lord's Prayer, right? On earth as it is in heaven. What he didn't tell us to pray was, Lord, get let enough people pray the prayer so that they can join our little ark over here to be safe from the big bad world out there until you come back. And then you start getting into all the different parables about how Jesus talked about the kingdom. The one that keeps running through my head as I was preparing for this is the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that's hidden in three measures of flour. And like as it goes through and divided, it touches everything. Another interesting thought here, because are you start, you're starting to pick up on the theme, right? The mission that the Father's been on is expanding the blessing that he releases on his people. It's about expanding the rule, the reign, the leadership of heaven on the earth. And that looks like more than just your spiritual life. That looks like your family. That looks like your finances. That looks like all that stuff. It looks like the way you relate to people, relationships, the way you think about yourself. The things you make, the things you put your hand to. Again, I'm going to point back to the Bezalel word that I gave at the very beginning of this thing. The Holy Spirit came on Bezalel as a creative to just make beautiful things. In Western society, we look at that. If somebody says they want to go to art school, for example, we immediately roll our eyes and like, yeah, that's you're really good. Like we instantly enter the sarcasm, instantly enter. The cynicism was like, yeah, you're going to make loads of money and do really great things with your life. Yeah. I would propose to you that the lack, as a side note, I would propose to you that the lack of joy that we see in Western society is because we've not prioritized beauty the way the Father does. So what happens when business people start releasing beautiful ways of doing business in the new year? What happens when businessmen and businesswomen start doing business in such a way where it's not just about how do I increase my bottom line, but how do I make sure that all of the people who I'm doing business with actually experience the same blessing that I have access to. Right? Now we're going back to the Father's mission. Another thing I want to question, I want you guys to just reflect on. When it comes to the mission, when it comes to being Jesus in the marketplace, why is it that we always think the way it's supposed to be done is exactly how we're not doing it? Say that again. Why is it that when we start to think about mission, when we start to think about evangelism, we always think the way that it's supposed to be done is the way that we're not doing it? Bringing you to go back to my story, my thought was, man, I really suck at evangelism and I suck at kingdom because I'm not Todd White. But then you've got the Todd White guys who are going, man, this part's easy, but why do I have such a hard time building kingdom relationships that last with people? There's a dream that the Father has over his bride. And it's so much bigger than any one individual person. It's so much bigger than just our small view of, man, if I just pray for somebody and they got healed, my whole office would get saved. Yes, that's good. The Father's view of your life and being Jesus in the marketplace is so much bigger than just that. And the more that we can catch that, the more that we can start to actually dream with the Father. And as we start to dream with the Father about how he wants to invade culture, invade your workplace, invade the day-to-day relationships that you have, that's when we start to be Jesus in the marketplace. That's when we start to see the kingdom of heaven bigger. Are we tracking? Yeah. Am I making you guys think? Okay. When you got like a prophetic edge to when you speak, the I, I laugh and I joke with people. The there, there's two, the faces that you guys are making right now is like one of two things. It's either, man, that's good and i got to think about that, or I'm really bored right now. Those faces are very similar, so that's why I checked in with you guys. So I, I'm going to kind of, again, I've got other stuff to say, but I'm kind of camped here, and I think there's something that the Lord wants to shift in our thinking. Um, Joe talked earlier at, about Zechariah, right, where... Israel had been exiled because they weren't following statutes, they weren't following the commandments. Um, 
they were very clear on why they got exiled. The Lord gave them hundreds of years of grace. Uh, and sent prophets to them and was like, hey, if you don't, this is going to happen. In Jeremiah chapter 29, okay, we all know Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 11, right? I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to give you hope in the future, to prosper, all of that. It's really interesting, if you go just a few verses before that, when we think about God giving blessing and, you know, a plan for your life and provision and all of that, we probably think about that in terms of, okay, when they get back to the promised land, God's got all this stuff for them. I've got a plan to get you out of exile. And while that's true, that wasn't the context of what he was saying. He was speaking to the exiles, and he said, seek the good of the city that you're in. And as the city is blessed, you'll be blessed. He said, give your sons and daughters away in marriage. Build houses. Start businesses. Seek the good of the city that you're in. And then that blessing is going to flow. And then he says, Jeremiah chapter 29, 11. Thinking missionally, thinking in terms of the Father's mission, doesn't just look like, again, how do I get all these people to pray a prayer and join my team? It's how do I just let the Holy Spirit do what he wants to do through me? And how do I expand my way of thinking about my own life to actually be in a place where I can dream with the Father about? This is where I want to start talking about um, start talking about your gifts. This is where it will start to get a little bit more practical in terms of like action points for you guys. Let me put the I have to check on time because I'm super prone to just like I can talk. I can talk I can talk. So I've got to keep myself keep myself in line. Um, as I was praying and talking to the Lord just about like okay, so Lord, our gifts have to matter when we talk about mission, right? Um, If you think about Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, God gives us gifts, and he expects, like, a multiplication on that, right? It's an investment. Another interesting side note way to think about that is uh, they grew the gifting on their life by putting it out into society, and then it came back with a return. So if your gifts only stay here, they're not going to get the full measure of return that the Father has available for you. That's so good. Um, so I'm like, Lord, the gifts have to have something to do with this, right? And the Lord, you know, I was talking about dreaming. The Lord just said, I'm looking for people who will dream with me about how their gifts can impact the world around. I'm looking for people who can dream with me about how their gifts can impact the world around them. Here's some stuff that I wrote down. I'm looking for people to dream with me around what's possible with the gifts I've given them. If you have a gift of discernment, dream around, like, what could that discernment do for life decisions and business deals that I have to make and the friends and family that I interact with? If I have a gift of hospitality, what would it look like to create a culture where people actually feel valued and seen? More than just, I'm the person who helps set tables out and chairs out when there's a church function. What if you actually started to dream with God in a culture where people feel super busy, feel super rushed, and are always bouncing from one thing to another, and they, people, let me tell you, people can feel when they're on the assembly line. It's so rampant in our culture, people can feel when it's just like, okay, I'm here to do the thing to get the certificate that says I did the thing and then I move on to the next thing. What happens if you have the gift of hospitality and you actually start to dream around, what if I can use this way that God's wired me to be able to make people feel welcome, seen, and included to pull them off the assembly line? What would that look like? What would that do to my business? If you have the gift of mercy, how can I how can I dream with the Father to put the heart of God on display? If I have the gift of generosity, how can I dream with the Father about the way that I can give into people's lives that doesn't just make them feel better about like, man, I've got this gift and that was really cool. What if we started to dream with the Father around, God, how can I give so much that it actually has generational impact on the people that I'm giving to? 
side note, how do you start to generate that much income? Anointed business people who do more than just get on the hamster wheel, right? If you have the gift of faith, how do I engage the gift of faith for the needs of someone who doesn't know God? It's really easy for us to put the gift of faith in the context of, man, I want to see healing, I want to see breakthrough for somebody, um, somebody in the church, but how? what would it look like if you know, you're in a meeting with your boss and there's these impossibilities that are starting to come up. Things in the market aren't looking great. And you actually got a gift of faith on you to actually start to address those things in the spirit and say, God, I'm believing that you can actually bring a breakthrough in my workplace, bring a breakthrough for my boss, bring a breakthrough in the business. Again, what's the mission that the Father's on? That the blessing that's on you would flow through you and actually touch the rest of society around you. And to temper that a little bit, it's not just about your gifts, but it's also about your fruit. If you live in such a way where you're only thinking about your gifts, you will become drained really fast. If you live in such a way where you're focused on the fruit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit being manifested in your life, you will have the energy and the character to actually sustain what God wants to put on you. Okay. A couple, few stories from my life stick out. So during that same season of my life that I was talking about where you know healing was starting to emerge, the prophetic and all of that, and it's sort of like kid in a candy store. Like this has got to work everywhere, let's try it. So if you, any of you guys remember Radio Shack? <laughs> yeah. I worked there just before they took the nose dive. Um, not my favorite job, but I would, that's where I was working at the time. Um, and I just, there was one, yeah, it all happened in one night. Um, so working at the store, there was me, an assistant manager, the manager, and then two other employees. Um, and one of the employees, she, her boyfriend was coming to pick her up, number one, because she had crazy allergies going on, could barely breathe. But she also had really bad scoliosis um, to the point where she was just in enough pain where she was like, I, I gotta go home. Um, so her boyfriend's coming to pick her up. And, you know, as you do when you're talking about your aches and pains, everybody likes to chime in about, like, oh, yeah, you got that. Well, this happened. So my other coworker was talking about how his knee and his elbow hadn't been the same ever since he went to a concert and he was pulling somebody up on his shoulders, dislocated his elbow, and then banged up his knee. Um, yeah, not fun stuff. Um, so I'm there in that moment, and I'm going like, okay, we're going we're gonna to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to pray for him. Um, so just as coworker number one is getting ready to leave, I'm like, hey, this might be weird. Can I pray for you super fast? She's like, uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I didn't even get to lay hands on her, just like reach my hand out across the, the counter and just said, like, in the name of Jesus, I can back and neck pain to go, I mean, your spine to come into alignment, and your sinuses to clear up. After I'm done, she goes and moves her neck, cracked, cracked. And then, one of my favorite things is the look on people's faces hey. after they know God did something. It's like a combination of jaw hitting the floor and going ghost white. Uh, she makes that face, so I'm like, he just did it. Um, and I said, okay, now try to take a breath through your nose. And she just instantly, like, again, she hadn't been able to breathe all night. She just like has that look on her face, and she's like, "I'm gonna go." <laughs> um, and my coworker is standing next to me while all this is happening, and he just kind of has like, you know, when people sort of do like the nervous laughter. He's got that going on. He's like, uh, ah, "I don't know what's happening." Um, so then, but at that point, there's blood in the water, right? So I'm just like, "Your turn." Um, so I pray for him, his elbow gets healed and his knee gets healed. Later on, it was either that same night or it was a couple nights later, I go to pray for, um, I end up getting an opportunity to pray for my manager because she had already overcome ovarian cancer once before. 
um, but she and her boyfriend had gotten pregnant. They were trying to keep the baby, um, but the doctors let her know, after, again, after she was already pregnant, that some ovarian cysts were starting to come back, um, not just ovarian tumors. So, but she's not going to hop on chemo because chemo's going to do all sorts of stuff to the baby. Um, she just sort of had made that decision she's not going to do that. So I just get a chance to pray for her. It was super brief and simple. She didn't feel anything. I didn't feel anything. She comes back several months later after the baby's been born, and she says, oh, by the way, I wanted to tell you uh, the tumors are completely gone. So why do I talk about that? And why do I tell that story in this context? When it came time for me to leave, they didn't talk to me about the miracles that happened while I worked. The reason they said they were going to miss me was because I was kind, because I paid attention to people, and because I had a lot of peace. Your gifts matter. Your fruit matters just as much. Again, what are we inviting people into? The gifts in some ways kind of work like a shock and awe treatment. It, when somebody gets healed, it jars them into like, okay, there's a there's a kingdom of God reality that's like making its way, barging its way into my sphere. So like now all of a sudden I have to think about this. But if all you've done is cultivate a lifestyle around your gifts and you have no fruit to back it up, you have no peace, love, joy, righteousness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, you have none of that to back it up, you're inviting them into the same emptiness that you're living in at that moment. Yeah. So good. Gifts and fruit. Gifts and fruit. And again, it just like it flows back into the what we've been talking about, the mission of the Father, right? The Father's desire is to bless every part of your life. Not just your ability to do cool things to get affirmation from people. His desire is to bless your relationships, bless your family, bless your finances, bless the way you think actually start to get you to think like him, to think like heaven. Here's a side note. I'm going to just sort of give to you guys something that you want. I'm still sort of like playing out how this is going to work, um, but those are the sorts of revelations that I like. They're the ones that invite you into further conversation with the Father. I was talking with him the other day, and he said, Aaron, what's revelation for you is process for me. What's revelation for you is process for me. Meaning when God comes and he drops something on you, like, hey, go do this, or like, man, I didn't know I could think about things that way. That already existed in the heart of the Father. That's not just this random thing for him. That's just how he is and how he does things. So if God gives you a revelation for your business, a revelation of how to treat your employees, a revelation of how to do a certain business deal, a revelation of how to interact with your boss, that's more than just a one-time, hey, I'm going to do this, and this cool thing is going to happen. He's actually inviting you into, this is how you used to think about it. This is how I think about it. What would it look like if you actually started to think like me? And that's the other invitation that comes with being Jesus in the marketplace. It's not just, how do I get results? It's, how do I let God shape and form me? into the type of person that I know how to let that blessing that he's given me flow through me and disrupt everything that's going on around me. Aaron, this is super good stuff, but you're being super hypothetical right now. Give me some concrete. I have some concrete for you. Um, I am super blessed right now to work for a company based out of Sacramento called WebConnects. Um, and just to give you a little bit of an idea of where this is going, um, one of the co-founders was actually on Shambles' podcast two different times because of the culture he's cultivated in the company. What does that mean? So we talk about culture of honor a lot in the church, right? We talk about, you know, what does it mean to honor people, honor their gifts, all of that. And that's super good. Most of the time it's just lip service. It's not a bash on anybody. That's just where it's at. So this co-founder... He and his buddy, again, they're both believers. When their business started taking off, um, and they talked about wanting to honor people, um, 
and also, they have a way of thinking. Um, I'll just release this to you guys. Um, their way of thinking about business is, their thinking is that corporations, businesses, are one of the biggest opportunities to create human flourishing in existence right now. Think about it. You're spending well over half of your life at work. So what happens if you begin to dream with the Father around, how do I have heaven invade my workplace? That's what these guys started to do. So just a really clear example of putting their money where their mouth is. They talk about honor, they talk about wanting to bless their employees. Every year, once a year, they take the entire company and their immediate family out of the country for vacation and they pay for the whole thing. Does that cut into their bottom line? Heck yeah, it cuts into their bottom line. You're talking tens of thousands of dollars to be able to do that. We're going to the Dominican Republic this year. Are they hiring? <laughs> yeah. I know. <laughs> but they actually said, God, how do, I, how do I bless the people that I'm working with? How do I take the blessing that's on them? Because again, they're running a super successful tech company right now. And they've got, like, they're doing well. They're doing good. But they're looking at, you know, what's the mission, what's the mission the Father's on? Human flourishing. How do I take the blessing that's on me and move it to other people? And they do super practical things like, hey, you guys work super hard. Let's take all of you out of the country for a week and your families and let you guys just have fun, relax, and get to know each other. Other stuff that they do. Uh, so we've got health insurance, right? Uh, they have actually a fund, an emergency fund, where the company puts away money to where somebody incurs a big medical cost that's out of nowhere they can actually talk to the co-founders, and the co-founders have money set aside to actually cover medical costs for people. One of, our, one of my coworkers just had her son a little over a year ago, and there were complications, and then you go to the hospital, get all this other stuff done. Co-founders came in and said, hey, we've got this fund, and uh, we've got bills, don't worry about it. Wiped out the whole thing. I know this isn't maybe as much teaching, but am I starting to spark some imagination in you guys? Am I starting to, like, I see wheels turning, and that's what we want. Um, there is no shortage of opportunity to bless people. If you think there is, then I'm just going to tell it to you like it is. If you think there's a shortage of opportunity to bless people, then you have an orphan way of thinking, and we can pray for you. But that, is, that needs to change. There's actually no lack in the kingdom of heaven. There's actually no lack for the Father. And that's what you have to give from. The Lord's not looking at you with you know, your student loan debts and your car debts and all that other stuff and saying, okay, now go find a way to financially bless people. He's looking at your life and saying, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I have all the creativity in the world. And I'm actually eager to bless people through you. If you would slow down enough to ask me what I want to do, I could probably blow your socks off. That's good. What's some other ways that this comes up? This one I like talking about because it uh, gets church people riled up in an appropriate way. Yeah. How many of you guys have worked a service industry job before? Like you've either been copied and all that stuff. Guess what the worst tip day is? Sunday. Sunday after church. <laughs> that should make you mad. What if the body of Christ got an understanding of the mission that the Father was on to bless people? And we started to have servers fighting each other for Sunday shifts. And 
it just takes like a little bit of dreaming and a little bit of planning. I know people who they've just made a decision as a family of we won't go out to eat unless we're going to tip our bill. And I'm not saying you've got to start there, but I can tell you from personal experience of having been able to do stuff like that a couple of times, even if it's not a crazy amount, people are so used to being overlooked, so used to having things demanded of them, that you taking one moment to say, God's blessed me, let me bless you with what I've got, that will blow someone wide open for the gospel. Here's another thought for you. Our, one of the ways we can tell our thinking is broken around this topic, around being Jesus in the marketplace, is we are uber compartmentalized when it comes to thinking about mission. We think, I'm either going to go do the mission thing, or I'm going to go home and not do the mission thing. But here's the deal. If we're going back to Genesis, Again, the original design that God gave humanity was be fruitful, multiply, and subdue the earth and release the blessing that's in Eden across the rest of the world. If we are thinking in terms of I'm either doing mission or I'm not doing mission, we're actually, it's not just that our thinking is broken, we're actually starting to function counter to the design God gave us. Because there's blessing in you and on you that's supposed to go out of you to touch every part of your life. So if you're only thinking in terms of, I can flip the mission switch on now or flip it off, no wonder you're frustrated. No wonder we have anxiety. Because we're actually running cross frame to how the Father designed us to run. So I want us to take a second. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left here. Again, lots of big concept stuff. I'm trying to give you guys stuff to go home and chew on and pray about. But to get down to being super practical. Um, one thing I'll say just because this is useful, um, and then we'll do that little prayer exercise I want us to do. Um, the only piece of advice that I can give you uh, when you start to move in the gifts, because again, that's only a portion of it, but it is part of it. God gives you prophetic insight about someone, discernment about someone. Um, the Holy Spirit is responsible for giving you revelation and insight. You're responsible for how you deliver it. You're probably not going to get received super well if you walk up to your atheist coworker and say, thus saith the Lord. <laughs> that doesn't mean that God isn't speaking, it just means we have to change the way we're releasing what he's given us. Um, and just what I've practically seen, most of the time, just taking what he's given you and asking it in the form of a question does the trick. Um, because then you're not only releasing what God's given you, but you're, then you're actually starting a conversation with him. So I'll give you that little thing, just as something to think about when you go and try this stuff. But what I want us to do we're going to take a few minutes and we're going to pray. And then what I want us to pray for is, God, who's one person in my life that you want me to love this week? And I'm intentionally using very open-ended language because what I don't want us to get into is that, again, that trap of being Jesus in the marketplace only looks like prophesying, healing the sick, casting out demons. God, who's the person, either at work, home, who is it that you want me to love this week? And just that little bit of intentionality, if we can start to do that on a consistent basis, we'll start to see those seeds bloom. Another thing I want to encourage you with, and then I'll shut up because I can keep talking. Um, Jesus in all of his parables about the kingdom usually talks about the kingdom like a seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that blooms. The 
kingdom of heaven is like leaven that's hidden in three measures of flour, and then it leavens the whole thing. Part of what we have to get really good at is understanding uh, living in the tension of God doing big explosive things right now, but also living in the tension of the patience that it asks us to have. The kingdom isn't just now explosive, all that stuff. It is that. But if you only live in that, then the moment God asks you to wait and let him water the seeds that have been planted, you're going to get really frustrated. I can tell by everybody's reaction, I think we've probably all been there. So I'm just going to pray for us, and um, then we're just going to have some time um, to just ask who that person is. So, uh, Holy Spirit, for starters, God, we just um, repent of broken ways of thinking around mission. Father, uh, we repent for thinking that uh, the only way you want to use us in the marketplace is just through signs and wonders. Um, and for those of us who think we can't be used that way, we repent even of thinking of thinking like that. Um, but God, we ask that you would begin to change the way we think, that we would actually start to dream with you about how can we bless people, how can we take the blessing that you've given us and release it to the spheres around us, that we could actually see the kingdom of heaven invade that way. Uh, God, I'm asking for boldness, and I thank you for the creative anointing that you're pouring out in this season. And I'm asking Jesus, um, several of you already have the face of the person in your head right now that you're supposed to, you're supposed to bless. God, I'm asking for creativity. I'm asking for um, also just that you would take the artificially high stakes we put on this stuff. Um, your word says you don't take the light and put it under a basket. A light doesn't have to try very hard to shine. We just have to not hide what you need. So Father, I'm asking that you would give us grace to know who, what, when, where, all that stuff. 